Welcome, I'm Mary Pohl, host of the Sales Mastery Summit. Aren't you kind of tired of listening to experts talk about how to sell in a non-salesy way? What does that mean anyway? It's as if all selling is a huckster profession, like all lawyers are ambulance chasers or something. Well, you will be relieved to know that today's expert is letting the world know that the selling is a whole new game today and that really everybody is in sales, even though only some of us get paid for it as a living. With me today is Dan Pink, author of To Sell is Human. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Mary. Thanks for having me. Well, our pleasure. It seems that your new work in selling has a bit of a good news, bad news message. Good news being that we are all naturally selling just to get through our life. And bad news is to be effective is a whole different game today. Is that fair? Uh, that's very fair. That's a good, that's a good summary of this book, uh, uh, To Sell as Human, which will be out in a couple of weeks. People can pre-order it now, and if they go to my website, there are a lot of cool little bonuses uh, and thank yous for ordering now. But yeah, that's exactly it. There, there are two big ideas that you identified, Mary. Okay. One of them is that, um, is that, like it or not, we're all in sales now. Uh, you still have one out of nine people in the U.S. workforce whose job it is to sell people stuff, mm -hmm. real estate agents, car dealers, whatever. But what I looked at, and I think those people are fascinating and do really interesting work, what I also looked at, though, was those, those other eight out of nine. And what I found out, um, with some survey data is that those other eight out of nine, as you said, they are in sales too. They might not be um, selling a Winnebago to, to a family and they might not be selling computer system to a large company, but they're spending enormous amounts of their time. And, when, and according to our data, roughly about 40% of their time trying to get other people to part with resources, trying to get other people to make an exchange persuading, influencing, cajoling in that kind of way. And it's what I call non-sales selling. And it's a huge portion now of what white collar workers do, an absolutely huge portion of what white collar workers do. That's the first point. So the second point, which you also identified, is this. Most people, probably not the people watching your program, but a lot of people who aren't in the sales profession, they don't like sales very much. They think exactly as you say, that it's Sales. Sleazy and skeezy and yeah. huckstery. And um, I have a very different take on that, having not being a traditional salesperson, but going in as an outsider and looking at this world. I have a very, very different take on that. I think that was once true. Um, that that view of sales as sleazy and skeezy was once true, but it was really a an analysis of the conditions in which sales had long taken place rather than about the nature of sales itself. In particular, what I mean is that most of what we know about sales, most of what most sales training programs, most um, um, of the books written about sales have really been for a world of information asymmetry where the seller always had more information than the buyer. So if I have a huge amount more information than you and you can't possibly get access to it, then I can take the low road. I, there can be some shenanigans. Um, and and that's what people that's why people think have this dim view of of sales as as pushy as sleazy as plaid sport coat on a huge on a used car lot. And my view is that we're no longer in a world of information asymmetry, or we're less in a world of information asymmetry. We're more in a world of information parity, mm -hmm. where the buyer has not only potentially as much information as the seller, and that's true in a car dealership. It's true to some extent in a doctor's office. Where if I go into my doctor and, and I have some particular ailment, I can go in there and say to him, hey, look, I just did this research and I know actually a fair amount about this potential um, illness that I have. And so in a world where, by, where there's some information parity, it's a very, very different world. And in that kind of world, the sellers have to beware. That is, we, we were all used to a world of caveat emptor, buyer beware. Now I think we've entered a world with also caveat vendator, seller beware. Because if I know just as much as you, and I have the means to talk back through Twitter, Facebook, whatever, um, you better take the high road. And that high road looks very different. And so what I tried to do is identify the particular qualities and some of the particular abilities that are necessary on this new landscape. 
Well, I, I think our viewers are um, appreciating the fact that information is at a parity now, and that really has changed the role of a sales professional. And um, so I was quite thrilled to see that you've also renamed the ABCs from always be closing, which is kind of that old huckster feeling, <laughs> got it. to something much more valuable in how really what, defining what a salesperson needs to be today. Can you share with us your ABCs? Sure. I mean, the, the advice of always be closing is not bad advice for a certain kind of world. It's not bad advice for a world where the buyer doesn't have mu that much information and the buyer has limited choices. You know, there's a, for purely self-interested reasons on the seller's part, there's a, you know, not a bad idea to kind of steamroller people into that decision. Um, it might not be necessarily the most moral or ethical thing, but it's not a bad idea tactically. Um, but my view is that that doesn't work anymore, so that we have a new ABCs, and they are the three qualities that I think are most necessary, both in this world of traditional sales and in this realm that I'm calling non-sales selling. And they are the, uh, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Attunement is the ability to take another's perspective, uh, profoundly important in a whole range of, of uh, functions. A uh, buoyancy is one of the things that buoyancy is basically the ability to stay afloat in this ocean of rejection that is both sales and non-sales selling. One one thing that that's, that that uh, established salespeople are really good at that civilians are really not very good at is dealing with rejection. And I think that more of us have to get used to dealing with rejection. That if we're all in sales now, we're all going to be in the rejection business too. And most of us aren't very good at dealing with that. And buoyancy or the quality is how you stay afloat. And then there's also clarity, uh, which is an interesting one. Um, you know, today, if I, if you have a potential buyer, again, in in uh, sales or non-sales, traditional sales or non-sales selling, and that buyer knows precisely what her problem is, she can might be able to find the solution herself. Where she needs some help is when she doesn't know what her problem is, or when she has the wrong problem. And so in this really interesting way, there's a, a new premium. We always talk about, oh, salespeople are, the, sort of the enlightened view is salespeople are good problem solvers. And that's not wrong, but I think that there's now a greater value, a less of a value on problem solving than there is on problem finding, on identifying problems people don't realize that they have. And so that's a big part of, of clarity. And so these three ideas, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity are really the kind of qualities you need to get better at moving other people. And there's some really, really interesting stuff if we harvest the social science about how we can get better at all of these capacities. Okay. Well, let's start with attunement. So if I'm trying to get somebody to part with their resources, how does attunement help me do that? Well, you want to, you want to part with your resources so you're both better off. I mean, you know, I could pick your pocket and you would be parting with your resources. That's okay. not an, enduring, an enduringly valuable relationship. Uh, really, what it, attunement really is is um, is the ability to take another's perspective, um, to see the world through your eyes. And what's interesting about that is that it's not quite empathy. E empathy is a great thing, but it's not quite empathy. It's actually more of a cognitive skill of do I understand where Mary is coming from? Do I understand Mary's interests? Do I can I see the world through Mary's eyes? And one interesting t there are a couple of interesting techniques for getting better at that. One of them is that there's a really curious line of research that shows that the more power somebody has, the worse they are at taking another's perspective. And so one thing that effective salespeople of all stripes can do is they basically go into an encounter and say, think of themselves as like, I'm not the one with power in this relationship. I'm going to sort of take myself one down. What that's going to do is that's going to allow me to see the other's perspective more clearly, which in turn will enhance my effectiveness. One salesperson I talked to had a lovely way to put this. She said, I sit in the, in the small chair so they can sit in the big chair. And there's some really interesting evidence in the social science showing that our power of perspective taking is enhanced when we sort of lower our, our, our view of our own power, when we're a little bit more humble, when we're a little bit more modest, that that actually has a sharpening effect on our perspective taking, which is quite fascinating. Um, and so there's some other, um, so, there, so that's, that's really what attunement is. Okay. So if we're really empowering our prospect in a sales situation, 
um, and working to be attuned with them and really understand what they're coming from, then I imagine we understand what they perceive as the problem and then we can step back into ourselves with our knowledge and help bring them to a new perspective. Is that fair? Exactly, exactly. But the starting point, exactly as you say, is, is, is able to understand it from, from your perspective. Okay. I mean, the fact that you might be wrong about your problem, it, that's, that's important. But what I need to do is, is, is first see why you think that is your problem and, okay. and really understand things from, from your point of view. Now, this, is, this becomes um, more urgent because, I mean, as you know, a lot of sort of in, in traditional sales, a lot of the smaller dollar items are basically transactional. You know, if I want to buy a, um, if I want to buy a, a piece of music, um, there aren't any record stores really left to go into to, to buy that music. So I can go online and do that kind of thing. But we're talking 99 cents for a song or 14 bucks for an album. When I'm doing more, when I'm doing, when I'm trying to sell, when I'm trying to buy other kinds of things, much higher ticket items, whether it's consulting services or computer systems in a business to business relationship or um, uh, 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 a house or any kind of sophisticated product, then it's really important for the seller to know what my point of view is and to really see the world through my eyes. Okay. So we really have to understand where they're at um, cognitively and then we can suggest from our experience. Sure. And you know other client examples, another way for them to look at it without. Yeah, and it's saying, also it's wrong. also a matter of not looking at every prospect exactly the same. Okay. Not looking at you as basically saying, okay, here's someone else with a problem. wallet I can open, but basically looking at you and saying, hey, this this is Mary, and let me understand Mary's let me understand Mary's point of view, and let me figure out okay. where Mary Mary is coming from. Um, you know, in and of itself, attunement doesn't get you all the way there, but without it. Um, you're either going to make some big mistakes or you're doing something that's purely transactional, which means you're not going to do it very long. Okay. Well, it makes sense. Nobody's sitting there thinking, oh, I'm completely wrong about this. So you can't just be in their face about it. Right. Cool. So buoyancy, that's a tough Buoyancy, one. yeah. So these are the qualities. I, there are also some particular abilities that are really interesting, but these are the quality. Buoyancy, I interviewed this, some of your viewers who are maybe – um, you know, around my age and perhaps a little bit older, we'll remember the Fuller Brush Man uh, used to travel. People under 40, I don't think, remember this, but I do. And it's really, it was quite a remarkable American phenomenon where there people, mostly men, although they did have this group called the Fullerettes, who, some women who, who, did, who went door to door actually selling cosmetics when they made a brief foray into that. But the Fuller Brush Company was this company started by this guy who emigrated to the U.S. from Nova Scotia. And he basically had this idea of selling brushes, good brushes, really useful cleaning brushes, hair brushes, door to door. And at a certain point in this country, there were just an enormous number of people going door to door selling brushes. At one point in the 1950s, their uh, Fuller Brush men made 50 million sales calls in a year. And this is when the United States had only 43 million households. So, yeah, it's incredible. So anyway, um, I am um, um, now you don't see Fuller Brush men very much anymore. I happen to find one of the very last ones, certainly the last one in San Francisco. And I spent some time with him, just a lovely man, really interesting, smart guy. And he had a phrase that really got me thinking about this. And he said, the hardest part about being a salesman is that you face, and this is his phrase, an ocean of rejection, an ocean of rejection. Mm -hmm. And buoyancy is how you stay afloat during that ocean of rejection. And then once again, if we go to the social science, it gives us some hints about how to remain buoyant even when we're getting rejected all the time. Uh, and it, it, it goes to what you do before an encounter, what you do after, during an encounter, and what you do after an encounter. And I'll tell you, I, I think it's really, I, to me, it's one of the most personally useful things in, that, I, that I discovered is what you do before an encounter. Now, we have this view. So let's say you're going into an important sales call um, if you're in traditional sales. Or let's say that you're just going in, you're, you're not a, in a pure sales function, but you're going in to pitch an idea to a group of people or to pitch an idea to your colleagues or something like that. In the moments before that, we human beings inevitably talk to ourselves, not out loud, but we talk, you know, we go over things in our head and we, it's what's called, not surprisingly, self-talk. 
And the view among the cognoscenti, or at least among the people who write self-help books, is that when you go into that kind of encounter, what you should do is you should pump yourself up. You should say, I can do this. I can do this. I got this. I'm on it. I'm, I can do this. And what's interesting is that the research shows something a little bit different. The research says that instead of saying that kind of declarative, affirmative statement, I can do this, you're better off asking a question. You're better off actually expressing some doubt. You're better off saying something like, can I do this? All right. Now, it seems kind of counterintuitive. Why is that? Well, it turns out there's actually a very good reason for this. Um, that you know, in the in the literature, why interrogative self-talk is more effective than declarative self-talk. And the reason is this: when we ask a question, even a silent question to ourselves, inevitably, we start coming up with an answer. Maybe sort of, you know, not necessarily explicitly, not saying it out loud, but if I say to myself before going in to pitch an important idea before my colleagues, can I do this? I start thinking about the answer. And I, and I might have, I might, and, and, in, and in giving that answer, I start coming up with the strategies and the tactics to do it. I start reminding myself of my experience in doing that. So what I start doing by asking that question is actually equipping myself in a very hard headed way for that encounter. So if I go in there and say, can I do this before, say, a pitch to a group of colleagues, in my self-talk I might say, yeah, I can do this. I actually have done this many times before. I've pitched ideas to my colleagues all the time and it's usually gone pretty well. Can I do this? Well, I'm actually really prepared for this. I, I have a sense of what people's objections might be and I'm prepared for that. Can I do this? Yeah, I know these people. I know a pretty good sense of what makes them, uh, what, what makes them tick. And so, that begins, um, and I know that this one guy, Fred, could be an obstacle, so what I'm going to do is I've got a, a couple of special things to hit Fred with. And so what you do with that interrogative self-talk is you, you start rehearsing your strategies. You start rehearsing how you do it. You start reminding yourself of that like, you're really genuinely equipped. If I simply say, I can do this, you know, the Bella Caroli school of motivation, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not equipping myself. Uh, you know, I'm just... It's, it's like um, okay. it's, it's a difference between um, real nutrition and a Snickers bar. I mean, Snickers bar will give you a little sugar jolt for a little bit, but it's not going to give you any real nutrition in, in, in how to do this. So there's a fascinating line of research. Um, it's really, I mean, it helped me personally because I just think, okay, I can, you know, I always thought that the affirmative self-talk was the way to go, but um, uh, interrogative self-talk is actually far more powerful and that's that's one of the things that helps keep you buoyant. Then there are other things too that are quite interesting, which has to do with um, uh, how you. Uh, one of the best predictors of people's success in sales, and this is in traditional sales, is a some studies of life insurance salesmen wasn't necessarily subject matter expertise, but was uh, how they explained their rejections. And so people who explain their rejections. This is what Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania calls the three P's. Okay. People who don't do well explain their rejections as permanent, personal, and pervasive. Okay, so pervasive. I go in and let's say I um, go back to my idea of pitching my colleague. Let's say I blow it. It's not, I don't, it doesn't go very well. All right? If I explain it as pervasive, I say, this always happens to me. Okay? When I say it's personal, it's totally my fault. Um, and when I say it's permanent, it's going to ruin everything. And there are some people who explain what who explain things that way, and that ends up being very debilitating. The better people, the people who are, remain buoyant, explain things as, well, is it my, you know, is it my fault? Well, maybe I could have done a better pitch, but actually, these guys weren't ready to buy right now. Is it permanent? Will it destroy everything? No, it's one, you know, messed up encounter it doesn't, you know, destroy everything. And is it pervasive? Does it always happen? No, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it works out. And so that uh, explanatory style is really important in helping people remain buoyant. And, and what I like about this line of research in buoyancy is that it really goes beyond um, going out on a sales call. I mean, it's things that yeah. you know, we can tell our kids about how to remain buoyant in the face of rejection. And as more of us, as I said earlier, Mary, as more of us move into salesy kinds of encounters, uh, we're going to get a lot of rejection, mm -hmm. okay? And, and I don't think that our kids, I don't think most of us are, who aren't in sales are really prepared 
to deal with that. I mean, I learned it as a writer about rejection. That's a, that. What that was my um, uh, that was the altar on, on on which I learned rejection. Hey, you want to, you want this story? No, we don't want this story. Um, we write a story immediately. Get in the old days, mail and an email. This is the worst story I've ever read. How they let you write anything is beyond me, you know. And so, the more we we get steeled in that kind of dealing with rejection, I think the better off we are, the more creative we are, the more successful we are in moving others. I like that. It's uh, they're the traits of an optimist. You know what? It's that's exactly it. Uh, in fact, the, the the research on Martin Seligman, his he has a classic. He's a guy at University of Pennsylvania, founder of the positive psychology movement. The book in which he lays out these ideas is what he, what he calls learned optimism. Okay. Um, and it's basically having an optimistic explanatory style. And so, you know, for all of my knocks on pot, on you know a declarative self talk and Bella Caroli and Anthony Robbins, there are some things in the social science that validates that. For instance, in the same thing on buoyancy, there's you know we like, tend to talk about positivity, um, and you know I, I don't know. I mean, I hear the word positivity. I, I just want to leave the room. And, and it turns out through the work of um, particularly Barbara Fredrickson at the University of North Carolina, it turns out that um, our ratio of positive emotions to negative emotions is actually really important in both our well-being and our, and our effectiveness. Uh, and that having a kind of um, so it's really she has a ratio. She has done some remarkable research with a Brazilian guy named uh, Marcial Lasada who showing that you want to have positive emotions at a rate of three to one to negative emotions. Okay. Positive emotions meaning joy, uh, gratitude, interest, curiosity, negative emotions meaning anger, resentment, disappointment. Um, and that it really, so even if you have say two to one positive to negative emotions, you're really not much happier than any people who have, you know, uh, posit, uh, whose, whose negative emotions outnumber the positive emotions. There's kind of a tipping point, and it's around, uh, it's around three. So, um, and then it has a ceiling at 11. So if you, have, you know, if you have 12 positive emotions for every negative emotion, you're in la-la land. And I can see it's not so much the rejection, it's how you handle the rejection on whether you take it positive or negative. Is that fair? That, that's exactly it. It's, it's really, I mean, in, in, in Sullivan's work, it's really, yeah, it's how you take it. It's how you explain it. Mm -hmm. And at some level, it goes back to that first point. It's how you explain it to, to yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, we do, it's, it's total, you know, it's largely ignored, but we do a lot of talking to ourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. some, you know, at some level, talking to ourselves is also known as thinking. Right. And so, um, and, and we, do, uh, we do a lot of that. And it's possible to change your um, your the style with which you prepare and also the style with which you you, you um, explain things and um, the grounding in the science is is quite remarkable so the before way to ha to be buoyant is to ask yourself a uh, interrogative self question self can yeah. I do this and then the after is the three P's do you have any recommendations for that during yeah the during is really what I was talking about before which is really keeping your keeping that positive to negative emotion okay. ratio uh, higher than higher than three to one. Okay. Uh, that is, that is, even if you do something like two to one, um, even if you do something like two to one, it, 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 it's, that's basically the same as, as having, as I mentioned before, as having your negative emotions outnumber your, your, your positive emotions. So it's really a matter of, you know, looking into your environment and taking moments for say something like gratitude, which is a very powerful positive emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and so one way to deal with, um, um, you know, one way to deal with rejection is to think about what you're grateful for um, and just maintaining that kind of more positive, significantly more positive than negative outlook with your yourself, your, your prospects um, has a big role in keeping people um, buoyant. That's interesting. Uh, one of the experts that I um, work with talks about how if you don't take a moment to anchor good things when they happen to you, they slip off like Teflon. That's, and, uh, I mean, that's, that, that's true. There's, a, there's, there's some research on that. It's, it's, it's also, it's also um, yeah, again, I mean, for your, for your readers who are interested in pursuing this, just um, 
check out the work of uh, Barbara Fredrickson at University of North Carolina on positivity. Um, uh, the, and the work on the explanatory style is Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania. And the work on the interrogative um, uh, um, self-talk is um, uh, well, the, one of the lead authors is, is Dolores Albaracin, who's now at Wharton. Okay. Okay. Well, many of our viewers have more complex selling processes, but I really like that you've boiled down a simplified selling process, which essentially is pitch, improvise, and serve. Can you share with us? Can yeah, it's not really, that? it's not so much a process as it is. These are the, you know, these are the, these are the kinds of uh, abilities that are really necessary. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm sort of agnostic on sales processes. I mean, I think on some level they make a lot of sense, but on other levels, especially when you get to the more sophisticated, when we're talking traditional sales here, the more sophisticated kinds of sales, they, they, they it defies any kind of process. It really depends at some level on people being, truly expert in the area. A, a good example of that, some, a really cool, interesting example of that are a couple of software companies that I write about. Um, one of them is a, a $100 million a year software company. The other is a $300 million a year software company. So not ginormous, not Microsoft, yeah. but you know, decent size okay. growing, decent size growing companies. And, um, so t take this company, it's called Palantir Technologies. It does um, basically data mining and data analysis kind of software for intelligence agencies and whatnot. Very sophisticated company. Uh, they do $300 million in sales annually, and they don't have any salespeople. How does that happen? Well, because, and, and you hear this from other kinds of software companies, this kind of weird Zen thing saying, we have no salespeople because everyone is a salesperson. And yet they're not directly selling. What they're doing is they're so good at the software, they're so expert in the software, that when they go out into the field to help their um, their clients, that itself is a form of, of selling. That is, it's basically helping them identify problems. So the border between doing the work and providing the service and selling is very, very murky. Okay. And so I've noticed a lot of these more sort of higher end, more sophisticated companies um, have essentially nobody in sales, but everybody in sales. And so, so anyway, so that, that's, that's just a long-winded point about, about process. So on, okay. um, on the pitch, you know, listen, we live in a, as you know, we live in a world of limited attention spans. And as a result of that, it's important for any kind of persuasion, any kind of effort to move people, to distill your message very succinctly. And so we've all heard about, <laughs> excuse me, we've all heard about the elevator pitch. Um, what I tried to do was identify six successors to the elevator pitch. Um, and again, looking at the social science for why they're effective. For instance, let's go back to, we do not pitch enough using questions. All right? We should be using the question pitch much more often than we do. And the reasons go back to that interrogative self-talk. Um, there's, there's research that shows, again, if you ask somebody a question, uh, they begin thinking it through, they begin thinking through the answer. And when they start thinking through the answer, if you have a strong argument, okay, this only works if you have a strong argument. I'll give you the best example of this in, it happened to be in politics, was 1984, um, um, uh, 1984, when Ronald Reagan said, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Now, he could have said your economic situation, um, you, he could have said your economic situation has... I'm sorry, it's 1980. I'm sorry, not, not 1984. That's where I was getting confused. 1980 is running against Jimmy Carter, the incumbent. And he could have said, your economic situation has deteriorated in the last four years. But instead, he, has to, he phrased it as a question. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Now, it was clear that most people were not better off than they were four years ago. But asking that question got people to think about there's a lot of research in this, got people to think about it. And so when they start thinking about it, they start saying, you know what, I'm not better off than I was four years ago, and here are the reasons why. And so they start articulating their own reasons why, rather than simply passively accepting your reasons. When people articulate their own reasons, they endorse them more strongly, believe them more deeply. And so using um, questions as a pitch is really, it's actually a really, really powerful technique. Okay. And one we don't one we don't use often enough. And then the improvise. The improvise is you know sort of recasting some of the language of sales. A lot of uh, you know every sales process as you were talking about before is about overcoming objections. 
Um, and I actually think that there are some lessons in improvisational theater that are useful in the w new world of selling. And um, because again, you know, I don't care, you know, you, you take your perfectly attuned, appropriately buoyant, ultra clear pitch, it's not gonna work a lot of the time. And you're gonna, and I'm gonna pitch something to you or be an encounter with you and you're gonna say something that throws me. And so the ability to get off the script, I mean, so much of sales has been scripted, but just like in, in, in theater, there's another form of, we have scripted theater, but we also have improvisational theater. And I think that the new world of selling is more like improvisational theater than scripted theater. And so what, do we, what improv artists are very good at are a number of things. They're good at um, uh, what the improv artists call hearing offers. So instead of looking at you at every, something that you say is an objection, I have to say there's embedded in every comment that you make is an offer. And I have to be able to hear the offer and accept that offer. Uh, improv artists, as most people know, are good at saying yes and. Uh, we love to say yes but, but they're good at saying yes and. Uh, and the other thing that's really important is that one of the key principles of improvisational theater is to make your partner look good. And I think that's a really important point in any kind of persuasion, negotiation, influence, sales kind of effort. Not in a false way, because again, that kind of falseness and, and underhandedness and low road is easily exposed and people can talk back. So I mean, like sort of, you know, putting you in a, putting you in a position where you actually look better after the encounter than before the encounter. That's such great advice because if you're improvising in particular with the yes and both of you can stay in creative open minds and not shut down and go into defense. Precisely. That is exactly the point of yes and. And there's some really interesting examples of that. That's exactly what it is. That yes and is expansive. Yes but is is narrowing. And it's remarkable how quickly that can it's remarkable how quickly that can happen. How quickly just a few yes buts limit people's options and basically crater the whole deal. Whereas that more expansive view of yes and uh, increases the possibilities significantly. Yeah, makes total sense. Now you kind of talked about how pitch and serve are merging together more. Is there any more that you'd want to offer on the serve? Well, serve, you know, my, 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 the point about serve is that, is that serve is really the essence of what it's about, uh, of what moving other people, persuasion, influences are. If you're, if you're not making people better off, you're doing it wrong. Um, and so by serve, I don't mean delivering a pizza in 30 minutes or less, although that's cool. I mean, if you're in the pizza business, that's it's important. It's not free what, anymore either. <laughs> yeah, what I mean is, is this, the, the ability to serve in the sense that um, thinking of your, it, it's sort of analogous to in the, in the world of leadership, uh, 50 year, 40 years ago, we had this notion that Robert Greenleaf introduced of servant leadership, mm -hmm. okay? And I think there's something about servant sellership. It's also connected to perspective taking where the act of selling, of persuading people, is itself an act of service. Um, and so there's some interesting things that you can do to make it personal, to make it purposeful, um, all, of your, all of your encounters. And if that becomes your kind of North Star, the North Star of service, again, not service in the sense that we usually think about it, but service in a more transcendent sense, then a lot of these other pieces then, um, a lot of these other pieces come in line. And, and just as it was a little bit strange back when Robert Greenleaf wrote about servant leadership. They said, wait a second, the leader's on top. You're saying the leader's on the bottom. What? That doesn't make any sense. I, I, and, and eventually over time, people, oh, yeah, got it. I think the same thing is happening with what we can think of as servant, servant selling, is that you're not necessary. It's really about you rather than about me. It's really about serving others rather than about um, lining your own pockets. But the dirty mm -hmm. little secret is that the most of, and you talk to anybody who's been in sales sales for a long time, they get this. Yeah, you win by this. helping them win. They, they, they get this big time. And so I think that that, that ethic of service is um, uh, really essential now. And it also has a cascading effect. That is, if more people start acting this way, then other people start acting this way, which means other people start acting this way, and suddenly we have much more enlightened approaches to commerce and other interactions with each other. Well, I'd say you could go so far as to say that um, to serve is how you're bringing clarity to the process, is through bringing clarity to the process. That Absolutely you're right. Abs that's exactly that, And that's, it feeds your buoyancy. 
That's spot on, right? Because I mean, that's another good point. I hadn't thought about that one. Yeah, that 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 when when we do good deeds for other people, when we help other people, we actually get a a lift in our subjective well-being. That's a very good point. I hadn't thought about that. So it has a connection to buoyancy. And and again, all these things are kind of, you know, all these things are kind of connected. I'm more likely to serve you better if I'm attuned to your perspective. Right. Obviously, right. Um, I'm more likely to pitch better if I'm attuned to your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm more likely to um, I'm more likely to hear offers if, if I'm attuned, but also if I have a clear sense of what it's all about, I have some clarity about the nature of your problem and the possibilities for the solution. So they all, you know, they all work together. And I think that's an important point because we tend to think we tend to think when we go back to sales processes, we tend to think of it as very linear. Mm -hmm. It's um, one, two, three, four, five. And like a dance, yeah, it, sort of. It's almost like a, almost like an assembly line. In fact, it, you know, yeah. the, um, it's like first you do this, or or a, a list of instructions for how to put together furniture. You know, it's like you have to follow them in sequence. And I and I think that it is a very different kind of system in that it's more, it's more kind of circular. It's more spherical. It's more self reinforcing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so helpful to have pieces of the science behind this since it impacts so much of what our viewers do for a living. Where can they go, Dan, to get more help on these ideas? Well, I mean, the, the, the book, which will be coming out in a, in a, in a couple of weeks, but, but it's available for pre-order right now, Good. Uh, is um, you can find it on uh, my website, which is danpink.com, D-A-N-P-I-N-K.com. Okay. And of course, you are um, well known for a couple of other little books that have been longtime bestsellers out there. Um, one on what motivates us, which obviously is important to our audience, and um, the other in really how we bring creativity to our work, which is also so key to sales today. Um, what can you offer up to our viewers in how that work ties together with our selling profession and really help us be the most effective we possibly can. Well, I mean, thank you for that. It's a good, and it's, it's a good question because I, you know, we, we tend to think that um, uh, I, one, of the, one of the things I write about in this book, To Sell as Human, is some of the other, I sort of take on this myth that selling is about sleazebaggery, but there's some other kinds of, there's some other kinds of myths, which is that sales isn't really, you know, sort of the myth of the blockhead, that sales is for people who couldn't be engineers. Sales is for people who couldn't be doctors and lawyers. Sales is for people who, you know, didn't do that well on their SATs. And I think that's absolute garbage. I mean, I think that right now, this new world of, when, you're, when sales is simply transactional order taking, maybe there's some truth to that. Yeah. But that's not what it is anymore. Sales has, t has gone the same trajectory as most white collar work. The routine algorithmic functions have been automated. And what that's leaving are the more sophisticated, complex, uh, creative kinds of aspects of it. So I think that um, that that today sales is it demands the, as as much, if not more, both kind of intellectual firepower and creativity as being an engineer, as being a physician, as writing a book. Um, and so it's one of the things that really irks me about that um, is this, is is that idea because sales is very very sales now is extraordinarily sophisticated. It draws on such an incredible rich repertoire of skills um, that I think that we do it a disservice by thinking of it in that way. The other thing about motivation, which is interesting, and that's actually how I got onto this topic, okay. is, um, is that the, really I started exploring sales in earnest because I was getting emails from readers after this book that I wrote called Drive, which argues that we've oversold carrots and sticks as motivators and undersold other kinds of motivators, um, I started hearing from companies saying, yeah, you know what, we did this with our sales force. And I kept hearing from companies that had eliminated commissions for their sales force and seen sales go up, which seems like, whoa, wait a second, what? And, um, and so the way that you motivate, um, you know, everybody needs to be well paid. There's no question about that. That's an important motivator. But the idea that, that salespeople are purely coin operated is, is a myth. Um, the idea that all you have to do for salespeople is, you know, stick a quarter in and they do a little dance and when the quarter runs out, time runs out, they do another little dance and you stick another quarter in there. Um, I think that's absolute, um, I think that's absolute mythology. And I think that one thing that non salespeople don't quite understand is that in sales, in contrast to other kinds of, I'm talking traditional sales here, 
in contrast to other kinds of professions, um, you get the kind of you get feedback in a way that no other profession really has. And so the money is in some ways a form of feedback too. You have a good sense of how you're doing in sales, which where you don't if you're an accountant or an engineer or other kinds of professions like that. So there are a lot of kind of myths that salespeople are, you know, money grubbing, uh, low road types who who couldn't get a real job. And um, I, I, I mean, if there's anything I can accomplish with this book is to demolish that idea. Well, if you take away the carrot and stick mentality, then people can serve better too. It's exactly right. So they're not distorted by, by that. And and what you see is you see, um, you know, the really successful people, the the money that they earn is a consequence of doing their job well. It isn't the goal in, a, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of pursuing excellence, the consequence of making someone else's life better. Um, and But it isn't the aim of the, it's not the point of the exercise itself. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Dan, what one thing would you recommend our viewers do so that they could be more successful in what they're doing in their role as professional selling or just selling to get through life? What's one thing they could do today to be more effective? You know, I'll give you a very small tactical uh, tip. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's something, it's a, it's a very powerful free idea uh, that comes from uh, Jeff Bezos, who started Amazon.com. And what he does in his meetings at, at Amazon with, you know, so he'll have a big meeting with the key software developers and the marketing people and so forth. Is that, so they'll sit around the table and he will keep one chair empty at this meeting. And that chair is to represent the customer, the most important person in the room. And I find this a really powerful technique for say attunement and even for service. And what I like about it is that it's free. I mean, it doesn't cost you a cent. And um, when I, I mentioned a few times in some organizations, both nonprofits and for-profits have started doing this, and um, it has a big effect. As you sit around a table talking about a particular idea or talking about how to sell stuff, having that empty chair says, okay, what would that person think about what I'm saying here? You know, would this person think that I'm being dishonest? Would this person think I'm taking the low road? Is what we're suggesting here actually good for that person? And so what it does is it brings into the room the most important person, which is the customer and the person you're trying to serve. Um, it's a very, very simple technique. It doesn't cost a dime. And, um, and I, really, I really like it. In fact, I've actually used it a little bit in my writing and basically thinking of a chair. I have a chair right there in my office yeah. saying, let's imagine that that chair is for the reader and is what I'm writing now going to be clear to that reader? Is what I'm writing now supported by the evidence so that reader will say, hey, this is, this is solid? And so, um, uh, so it's a, you, know, you can call this exercise, pull up a chair. Perfect. Well, Dan, thank you so much for one, updating the perception of selling in the world, and two, letting us know really what sales effectiveness means today. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, it's been a pleasure being with you, Mary. Thanks so much. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in and investing in your own success. The Sales Mastery Summit is here to help you never stop learning from the best. Take care. Thank you.